Hey everyone, it's your boy Josh. I hope you're having a great day scrolling through YouTube and I'm here to talk to you about a very cool song from Jeff Williams called Sacrifice. I'm gonna analyze it a little bit and then theorize it a little bit, you know, the lyrics and uh, yeah, let's see what we get. So analyzing it musically means starting from things like the rhythm and the time signature, which is in 4-4, four -four. <laughs> easy as that, and then uh, we're gonna talk about the key, and that's cool. The key is uh, kind of interesting because it starts off in a key, but uh, as soon as we get into the verse, the key gets flipped on its head. This key derives from the harmonic minor, but it's the fourth mode. With harmonic minor, we get the harmonic minor mode, the Locrian sharp six, the Ionian sharp five, and the Dorian sharp four. And that's the key we're in at the start of the song, Dorian Chap 4. And what's the root note? It's D. D sounds like a very good choice because of the tuning of the instruments. Because the bass and the guitar will be tuned in drop D. So you're here under a Sardinian sun and you're wondering what the hell is drop D? Well, guitar tunings are usually in E standard, which means that the root note is E. And standard is just a word uh, we associate to the intervals between the strings. So the first string is going to be E, and then we're going to get a perfect fourth, another perfect fourth, another perfect fourth, a third, and another perfect fourth. So they're all perfect fourths, usually, apart from the third to last and the second to last, which have a third in between. And drop D is different, the root note becomes D. And that's all that changes. Uh, you get this fortunate combination of intervals that lets you just play a chord if you tap one fret. This lets Jeff access uh, a lower key than usual and it, it lets him have power chords everywhere. And we can tell we're in D door in sharp 4 because of what the percussion plays. Also because of the notes that Casey sings. So these are the notes from the percussion and I wrote them in a media instrument so that I can pile them all up in the same octave and get a scale out of it. How I do that is, that is by piling them up on the left here and then I can get this little tiny scale. The problem though is that right now I've only got 6 notes. And to find the seventh one, I'll have to look at what Casey sings. To find the one that's missing. That's the one. That sounds about right. And here I'm harmonizing, which means that I'm making a, a progression of chords built from the scale itself. And this is what it sounds like. So this is Dorian sharp 4 and in order to get the harmonic minor scale I have to change the order of the chords like this so that I can have A minor major 7th at the start thus I get A harmonic minor and proving that Dorian sharp 4 actually derives from this harmonic minor. And then in the verse we get A Aeolian which is almost just a simple change of root note but A Aeolian doesn't share all its notes with D Dorian sharp 4 and but it's only got one difference and it's a G sharp if it were uh, a simple root note change then we would have to go into A harmonic minor as we've seen with uh, the harmonization However, there are many indicators that this isn't the case. For example, the chord we get isn't A minor major 7th, but it's A minor 7th. And also, we should we should get a G sharp as a chord, but in the chorus we get a natural G, which is the flat 7th. And as we all know, the exotic characteristic of the harmonic minor is that it has a natural 7th, a major 7th, not a minor seventh. So we go from a very evil, a very evil and nefarious mood to a dramatic and serious mood. I'm starting off unsettling and stuff, 
But now, yeah, now I'm talking seriously. So listen to what I have to say. That's the kind of vibe that's going through the song. And all, all it takes to do this is to start the verse in A minor. And that's what it does. And it, it, it plays A minor for a long time. And it's 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 one of the chords it stays the most on. Not even the chorus is very D oriented, and it's a lot more A oriented. That's why it sounds like it's got a different root note. I mean, at the start, it the most played note. It, on the bass especially is D and that changes the perspective in which we see the key which makes it sound like the root note is D Whew. instead of being A like the rest of the song is now speaking of bass the bass is very interesting it uses both the minor third and the major third it makes a very om ominous atmosphere and it's really good to start with. We get lots of similarities with uh, Tyrion's song because look, just the intro is based on low instruments and high instruments. So the bass and the high percussion. In the middle we get the drums and the voice but the leading instruments are the bass and the treble. Now you may be thinking what about what about the guitar? Uh, there's a guitar in the rest of the song. Why isn't there a guitar at the start? Why are the trombones playing in crescendo chords? Well, that's the guitar, but it's just reversed. And that says a lot about Jeff's intention. He wanted to unsettle us, just like he does in Tyrion's legacy. The consequences of this are a gap in the mid range. Usually, composers use this technique at the start of a piece and leave room for other instruments that come later into the piece. The missing frequencies make the listener want to fill the gap, creating a small tension which is resolved when the mid-range is filled in the climax by the whole orchestration. So yeah, using the minor third and the major third in the same lick is really effective in building an unsettling vibe. Because you don't you don't know if you're supposed to feel dark or if you're supposed to feel bright. It's kind of in the middle, and that's that's the whole thing that unsettling is. You know, ambiguity, ambiguity in the middle section of an orchestra, and ambiguity in is this major or minor? Ambiguity in mode. So we actually get quite a few theories about who sings it and who it's for and you know the most popular points of view are obviously Raven because she appears straight after the song is played in the credits of volume 2 and then the other contender is Cinder because she's evil and it's an evil song and to be honest it makes sense because you know looking at the key it's a very evil key it's a very creepy key so Cinder makes sense it sounds evil, must be an evil character, but yeah. Another interesting take is that the song is actually sung by Oscar and Ospin's hosts to rebel against Ospin himself. And I quite like that theory. Oscar came by in like volume 4, right? And the song is from volume 2 and it just seems like such deep foreshadowing. It might be even a stretch. As in, this song was from Volume Two. I doubt there were. It, 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 I doubt it's sung by a character we don't even know yet. I can't talk about a sacrifice theory without talking about the greatest video in all existence. Mother Birds' video, Salem Sacrifice, right? He thinks that it's the song is about Salem and Osbin and all that drama, and I also agree, but. In his point of view, he doesn't have a singer quite figured out yet. The perspective of the song is still ambiguous to him. Anyway, so here's the T. Here's my interpretation of the song Sacrifice. You know, one of us is going to have to change. So let's start with the fact that Crow always knows that trouble is going on somewhere. Right? Somewhere on Remnant, 
Amber is getting attacked and Krog is there to help her. Somewhere on Remnant, Ruby is getting attacked by Tyrion and Krog is there to help them. I'm also associating this to the power that Osman gave him. To be an eye of Odin, he's supposed to see everywhere. And I'm thinking, there could be a parallel version of this for Raven. What if Raven can see everywhere? Right? So she doesn't know what's happening everywhere on Remnant, but she knows what's gonna happen, what's happened. Or what if this is the way she found out these secrets about Ospin? What if Ospin gave Raven the power to look at the past, the present, and the future? And that's when she decided that Ospin was not trustworthy anymore because she found out about Salem. Another piece of evidence I can use to help me with this theory is her conversation with Crow in Volume 4, Chapter 4, I guess, Family. She tells him, I told you Ospin would die, and he did. I told you Beaker would fall, and it did. It, it could be proof that she can see the future. It's all things to think about, and I think, I just like that theory. And it's, it fits in with sacrifice, it's, it fits in with a lot of things, and it's, it's possible. It's plausible. So, you know, until I'm proven wrong, I don't know. I'll stick with this one. Anyway, let me let, let, let me know what you think uh, about, about all the stuff. I I am open to discussion and I love all opinions and I hate on nobody. This video was requested by Hyper's Funeral because of a little challenge I set up that he won. Uh, and I just gotta thank you, Hyper's Funeral, because you've given me so much support. I, I have to love you. Like, there's no... there's. <laughs> There's no alternative. I gotta respect you. <laughs> and I have to I have to thank all my subscribers because there's a hundred of them. There's at least a hundred subscribers to my channel. I've reached a hundred subs that's it's crazy. Hundred people listen to me talk about nerdy stuff like this. Like I love you all. I love you all. y'all are crazy. And to all the people that I've thanked so far, I'd like to wish a fruitful summer. And be sure to stay tuned for the next video. But until then, I don't know, you can surf my channel and pick something you like. My page turns scan real quick.